What is this nationalism thing that we're talking about? Here? What is it? Right. Well, I, 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 because I lecture on nationalism also in, in university, it might sound a bit academic, but essentially there are two meanings of the term nationalism. One is that it is a social or political movement, uh, a concrete movement to acquire, say, an independent state. And the other is it's kind of an ism, like liberalism, socialism. So the ideology, in, in a way, of nationalism, which emerges you know, post-Rousseau, uh, late 18th century, and then with uh, Herder, the German romantics, kind of comes in the early 19th century. So it's both an ideology, I guess, and a social and political movement. And when, in everyday language and discourse, in what sense do people mostly use the term? Well, I think mostly for extreme nationalism or malign forms of nationalism, militaristic, <coughs> chauvinistic, racist type nationalism. And you you work a lot on demographics and on the uh, <coughs> in, in this sort of area and related areas. What's your sense of where the discussion, where we are in our discussion of nationalism today as, as a force and as, a con as an animating force in our politics? Right, yeah, it's very interesting. So I think if you were to look back to 1989 or you were to look back to 1945, the concern was very much on political forms of nationalism that involved revision of borders. Just, you know, either a, you, know, you might imagine a group breaking away from another society. So it's, it's that political form of nationalism. I think that the moment we're in now is very much Borders are not really being questioned greatly. Yes, we've got Catalonia and Scotland, but by and large, the kind of nationalism we're looking at is more of a cultural nationalism in, it, in the West. Uh, and this concerns very much the issues, issues around ethnic change and, and immigration. So that's a very specific form of nationalism, and it's a newer focus, whereas 1989 in Yugoslavia and all of that is, is, is quite distinct. So I think it's a distinct, there's a distinct reason why nationalism is on the agenda now as opposed to the past. And do you, in your mind or in your work, differentiate between things like patriotism, I mean the stuff that happens maybe around the Olympic Games, for example, uh, or the stuff that will undoubtedly happen when the World Football Cup starts soon, and <laughs> other forms of nationalism? <laughs> right. Yeah, I think nationalism, it's a bit like populism, it's one of these things that can be adapted to many different ideologies, you know, liberalism, uh, religion, um, socialism, fascism, whatever. Um, so it's a very flexible kind of ideology, which I think is why, to jump the gun, I think they're good and bad forms uh, of nationalism, because it's very protein. Um, and what are some of the good forms of nationalism? Well, I think that, uh, I mean, you can think of, if a country, you know, if you think about Estonia being taken over by the USSR and wanting its freedom back or, or decolonization, uh, countries who want to be free of empire, you know, you can see where that drive for autonomy is, is can be a positive thing. Um, you can think of the aim to preserve a language. Um, Quebec nationalism, for example, wanting to preserve French in Quebec, that's, that's a, perhaps a positive thing. And then, of course, in a way, it's hard to think of, of being Canadian. That's quite, quite an acknowledgment for me. Um, but, uh, but no, also, um, in terms of public goods like democracy, um, welfare state, for example, it's very hard to conceive of these things emerging without the nation. Uh, and in a way, the whole, the sh if you look at the French Revolution and the emergence of the modern nation, the whole concept of popular sovereignty, that the people rather than the monarch should rule, democracy and the demos is very much tied into this notion of nation. So it's very hard, I think, to separate uh, democracy and nation. And so th those would be some of the areas I think there are some positives. So, I mean, you, are you, I'm you, waggling my microphone up and down. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Are you? Yes, 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 I agree. Sorry, I, I mean, uh, where, where, do, where, do, where do I stand? Where do you stand <laughs> on the matter of good um, nationalism and that, or good? So, how so do you think about the this? thing is, I think that there is a kind of real tendency in the political commentary up to talk about nationalism as always a bad thing, and then somebody, some kind of outrider, will say, no, 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 it's a brilliant thing. It gave us. The Olympics gave us where would where would Danny Boyle be without nationalism, and it's very much a kind of projected conversation. So the the kind of political class decides how the people are with their nationalism, and then decides whether the people are in a good place or a bad place. And I think actually, 
um, you know, obviously, obviously looking at them in kind of in a, in a real way and the way they're voting is useful. But I think there are kind of unresolved issues about the way we think about nationalism and nationhood, with on both on both at both ends of the political spectrum, which I think are the reason why we're in the fix we're in, and I will explain that. Um, so, there, so I had this argument with a with a kind of lefty friend, a progressive pro progressive alliance we call ourselves, um, but really we're just lefty friends. Um, and I said I care more about a family that can't feed itself in Darlington than in the Dordogne. And he said, Well, I don't. And I said, Well, how can you? How can't you? And he said, Well, how can you? You know, if you believe in universal human rights, then you believe that family who can't feed themselves in Dordogne. Um, are, you know, they should be able to feed themselves just as the family in yeah. Darlington should. And I said, but okay, so just if you just play that out, if there was somebody giving birth next to you, you would go and get her a towel, right? Whereas you know right now there's somebody in Madagascar giving birth without towels, and yet you get on with your daily life. So you have to admit that there is a kind of geographic element to how much you care about the people you're around. And he said, no, no, that's just, that's just silly. <coughs> is it? Sorry. Um, and actually, it was a kind of very real fissure in both, on both the left and the right, actually, this idea, whether or not it's kind of toxic, to care more about your <coughs> compatriots. And how do you characterise the Conservative version of that? Well, the Conservative version of that would be Theresa May, citizen of nowhere. So she's very clearly saying, I'm on your side because you're British, and I, I know that you're British because you're a British citizen, and if you're not a British citizen, then you're a citizen of nowhere. And that... What she was trying to do was parse a difference between herself and Tony Blair with this kind of, you know, we've all got to be global, we've all got to be in the market, it's got to be the fastest. I can't be on your team just because I knew your dad. We've all got to make, uh, you know, we've all got to make the best trainers. Um, and she was trying to say, no, actually, we have a kind of pre-existing, but it really backfired because that's not the way to characterise it. You can't say one citizen is superior. I can't say that family in Darlington are more important than the family in Dordogne. I just have to say they're more important to me. And there's a kind of abstract political argument, which is the Wolfgang Street argument, that your democratic identity is bordered, so your democratic, because all your agency is bordered, so your identity has to be bordered. You know, it, it, the only decisions you make that are of any democratic importance are within your own borders, so of course that's where your care and allegiance lies. But I think that actually there is a kind of deeper emotional border and that is both good and bad nationalism you know there are there is good and bad that can come from that because I think when you start saying it doesn't mean anything to me and the people within my kind of democratic purview are no more important to me than the people of America then you don't those pe those people eventually turn around and say well go away then you know I don't want you representing me I don't want to be spoken for by you I you know you either care more about me or or go away. And how, how far are you comfortable going down that line? So, for example, it has been pointed out that that argument that you just made about um, uh, it having more, as it were, solidarity with someone in Darlington than the Dordogne is reflected in the fact that we spend, what, about a thousand times more on social security in this country than we do on foreign aid, for example. So I'm heavy breathing into my mind. Well, I, um, I mean, do, do you... Would you well, but, I mean, yes, but you know, that's a, that's a completely common sense thing, isn't it? Nobody would say you should spend as much on foreign aid as you spend on the social fabric of your own nation because you're, because you're trying to create something real. And within that, like the welfare state, like the NHS, and within that reality, you can obviously accommodate a sense of your kind of national purpose as having something to say to other countries, but you can't say, okay, we're just going to spend it equally between everybody. Mm. Um, so we all acknowledge and would acknowledge, I think, that we're embarked on a shared project and that project does involve prioritizing each other, but project. because we're not prepared to A, admit the priority and B, stick to the priority, we get these kind of horrible social fissures. So I think what very much happened from 2010 onwards was citizenship became very conditional. It was conditional upon you being working. It was conditional upon you being the right sort of family. You know, problem families were no longer real families. The workless households were no longer real households. It was conditional upon you being healthy. Disabled people were no longer part of the contract. It was conditional upon all kinds of things. And citizenship did become very precarious and a sense of kind of patriotism, if you like, a sense of solidarity from your shared patriotism came under sustained attack, not through an immigration debate, perversely, but through a welfare state debate. 
And that kind of change of angle did generate this very splenetic um, response, which I totally understand. You know, it's like if, you, if your citizenship is under attack because you're, you're not economically productive enough, you would say, well, how, why aren't I more important than that person who just arrived? But in, what, in what sense was pe were people's citizenship under attack? Well, no one was being denied their citizenship. Well, the, the, the Windrush people. Well, no, that, that, that <laughs> is a, a fiasco. I mean, tell that to Lambert. But, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing fiasco. That fiasco has been going on since actively since 2014 and previous to that since 2012. So, you know, we say, oh, this is just a fiasco. But it's actually a very, very sustained and, you know, quite... Um, quite meaningful fiasco. The, so I, I, sorry to interrupt sorry, I just want, to, yeah. I want you to walk me back through that. So how does the Windrush thing about it... The Windrush thing, I just, I just was making a point. Incredible story. <laughs> the Windrush thing, I was making a side point. Yes. Um, but, no, th there is basically... If, when you, if, if there is such a thing as national citizen contracts, I'm not by any way just going to defend the government for <laughs> no, no, unbelievable no. scrub. But if there is no, such a thing as national... Tory. If there is such a thing as national... <laughs> uh, well, I'm not, but it doesn't matter. If there is such, <laughs> if there is such a thing as national social contracts, um, then you would have to have some kind of policy towards well, illegal immigration, quite, although you wouldn't. Obviously. It won't be, yeah, but it wasn't the illegal immigration that was the problem. It was the way the government talked about its own citizens that was the problem. So, you know, obviously we would have all been up in arms as well if they'd come straight out saying we're going to deport a load of people who are already British. That would have been a problem. Um, but where there was a kind of definite change in language wherein a number, a large number of citizens, basically any, they, they, at one point all benefit claimants, which was a very large amount of the population, were considered suspect by, in the political language by which they were spoken. And that is really problematic. So even though people don't go out marching when, when a politician divides them into strivers and shirkers, or could, develops a problem families, uh, sorry, troubled families um, program, or it develops policy designed to, you know, countermand the horrific nutritional choices of the work of the lower orders, um, even though that they, it's, it's never quite enough to kind of get you on the streets it does have a corrosive effect on your sense of yourself in relation to your government because you're sort of being treated, you're sort of being talked about as though you're scum. I mean, I don't know if you remember that classic case when, and it wasn't, there was a classic, there was a horrible, horrible case where a father, the Philpots, the father set fire to his family yeah. um, and all the children died. Um, and then there was, and then it just got worse and worse. And the mother tried to give the father a blowjob in the back of the police van. I think. Um, sorry, that was the unnecessary detail. Um, but there was a lot of commentary at the time, which really, which was shocking, that said this is the product of a benefits culture. Okay, I'm going to stop here. I just want to jump in. Sorry. Sorry. No, I mean I, was, I did go way no, off. Well, you but did. You I did, was but sort you're, of. Sorry. You're on the penumbra of a lot of things that are all connected, aren't you? Which is to do with the way that. The way that things that I just called national social contract, but I'm sure we have a different name, the way that we think about welfare, entitlement, and who's entitled, yeah, yeah. that these are all connected. I want to bring Eric back in both to respond to any of the points that Zoe's just made and to, and to pick up some of the zero-sum thinking that has come into this area. I mean, what, what, what's your response to some of what Zoe was saying? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, any time you have a democracy, you have to define the demos, who are the people, and that does bring in the question of, of illegal immigration. For example, if someone just shows up, uh, you know, you can't have a community without boundaries, but then on the other hand, obviously, there's a balance. You don't want to kick people out who have been here, let's say, even illegally for, say, a decade, but they've got dependents and kids and whatever. So it's all, I think it's about a striking a balance there, but yeah, I think all countries have to boundaries that they enforce, or else pretty soon <laughs> you're going to have vast numbers coming. But I guess my point was that the immigration is always the end of the conversation, not the beginning of the conversation. So the, we, we, ne we didn't start off hate, as a country who hated immigrants, and n not, nor did Hungary, you know, nor did, you know, it, it, it always comes, it, it it always comes as a response to a previous breakdown in the social contract. I guess, I guess maybe this is where I see things slightly differently because I mean I mainly look at sort of large scale survey data and on this and I don't think that the economic material side is that big a driver, certainly of the populism we've been seeing recently, that this is largely to do with 
cultural and ethnic types of insecurity. Uh, not, not, not in Eastern Europe, you know, but, but in the West. Insecurity Obviously. doesn't come from nowhere. And I think this is the... Because I've been in a lot of meetings where everybody's gone, this, look at the metadata, there's no connection between the economic situation and the way people respond to these surveys. There's no, you know, this is not a direct co correlation. You can't to, you can't track it back to the financial crash, even though miraculously it's all been since the financial crash. Um, and there is a kind of real resistance to making an economic argument about it. But there is, it is completely demonstrable uh, kind of a link between the way people frame poverty in their country and the responsive anti-immigration coming from the cohort who are framed as kind of poor and a drain on society. And it's, it doesn't, it's not reflected in survey data because nobody ever goes out and asks the question, do you hate immigrants because everybody makes you feel like scum? But I think if they did, they would get some interesting answers. Well, I mean, maybe, yeah, I think we might have to have a difference here because I'm sort of, you know, I believe in sort of representative data and, and, and you know, those sorts of methods. So I guess I would expect to see, if it was economic, I could expect to see certain things like unemployment, being unemployed, losing your job, lower income. Be, you know, that should correlate much more with, say, voting Brexit or Trump or any of these things than it does, whereas actually it's much more to do with things like you know, the death penalty is something I've written about. So support for death penalty is a much stronger predictor of Brexit voting than anything economic by far. Can, can I, sorry to interrupt you, Zoe. I mean, that's, I mean, actually after you. No, 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 you go. Well, I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you, Eric, in your work on populism, because the, 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 the so-called white working class, the British white working class is about whom one should be very cautious about generalizing about millions of people. Nonetheless, there was that Citizens Voices survey that Demos published in uh, January, I think, of this year, maybe, maybe February. Um, and to go back to this question of, of nationalism, in which there was a sort of, part of the, the report was that values, tradition, and the, 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 those people who responded to the survey, at least, reported that their values and traditions and heritage were considered to be worthless. Now, as, as many of those things are also national symbols, if you like, to what extent is this an issue in what's going on in populism in your mind? And I may have mis sorry, it's got mangled the question slightly, but you know what I mean. What, there's a nation, there is a sort of nationalist component to the populist backlash demonstrably, clearly. And in this country, some of that has to do with the denigration that the perceived denigration by certain sections of this, of this country of, of national symbols and... Tradition. I still don't understand. Sorry. Are you, yeah. do, do you mean that people are anti-immigration because they feel their national symbols have been traduced? No, I'm not, I, I'm not getting to the anti-immigration part yet. Sorry. But I, it's more to do with the status, the status of certain national symbols. The, the flag of St. George yeah, is a yeah, really yeah. obvious yeah. example. And that then certain traditions and certain aspects of so-called English or British life that uh, what the white working classes, at least in the Demos report, Citizen Voices, reported were being were denigrated and were, were considered to be worthless. Uh, yeah. And the sort of zero sum thinking that's in cultural politics. <coughs> I'm lo if you're winning, I'm losing. That kind of thing. I mean, I, I want to see what. I want to know what. Well, what, if we look at what underlies sort of immigration attitudes, again, the economic <coughs> input is generally quite weak. Again, what it a lot of the literature, again, the academic literature shows is its identity threat and. It's deep-seated cultural values. I mean, this is from the social psychology literature around authoritarianism and, and, and conservatism. But a lot of this is, these values are things which are set quite early in life and really this, this you know, there is an important deep-seated value divide that people, regardless of whether they're left or right on the economic spectrum. And that's coming out politically much more. And there's a book called The Authoritarian Dynamic by Karen Stenner that really, she's done a lot of experiments and surveys on this, but it's very clear that some people like change and diversity and others like stability and security. These are very deep-seated psychological orientations and they're becoming more and more important politically. And I think that's really, so instead of thinking about working class or middle class or rich or poor as the dividing lines, or even young and old. I mean, it's these deep-seated psychological orientations that are the strongest. The orientations that you've perceived, I, I, have, yeah. I have a great, a catastrophic disagreement, but yeah, no, I, want, with I, I, want, I, want, I just want to know what the distinctions <laughs> are instead of all those other ones. Well, I mean, first of all, you know, in terms of the economic redistribution versus low taxation, that's kind of the left-right. That's sort of being overshadowed by this, oh, call it open, closed, globalist, nationalist, 
which is very tied into these deep values around do you do you like change and, and, and difference or do you not, uh, which are you know which are there. I mean, like, according to the social psychologist, those things are deep seated already by the time you're an adult, um, and they're being politicized now. So I think those are so it's the difference between those people who embrace change or. or, or want to shape it, and those people who see themselves as the authentic embodiment of certain things, is that what to be well, different? Well, because they are, their fundamental general orientation is towards security and stability, they are going to be more likely to become attached to symbols of the ethnic majority and of the nation. Okay. So so well, uh, this is a very Tony Blair line, right? The, 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 um, the world divides into open and closed. People who like things open and people who like things closed. And if he thinks the world would be better if everybody liked things open, then he should be open to the idea that he should stop making the argument and get somebody else to make it. Because every time he does it, people get a little bit less open and a little bit more closed. But um, <laughs> there is kind of... The, the, all of these values which you can you can kind of divide in that way, in the open closed way, you could also divide in the kind of Lakoff way, authoritarian versus nurturing family model and there are people who are more kind of naturally authoritarian and there are people who are more naturally or nurturing family but we are all bi-conceptual and we all will respond to arguments with that bit of our brain so you know I would kind of be predominantly nurturing family and if you want proof you should see how badly behaved my children are um, but I will respond to an authoritarian argument when it's put in the right way and I'm in the right mood. So, you know, we've all got these t sides of our brain where we can respond to kind of loyalty and flags and stasis and nostalgia. And then we've all got this part where we, where we can respond to kind of ambition and openness and generosity and change. Um, but what we need to kind of think of now, I think, is why people are responding so much to quite destructive and suspicious arguments and they are responding very strongly to authoritarian arguments which I thought we buried 20 years ago and which ones do you have in mind well you know I mean it, it, it's like serious look on Twitter you talk about the St George's flag and it's kind of quite a neutral thing when Demos says it you're like yes it is a shame we should have more St George's flags if people feel that strongly about them mm -hmm. and then you look on Twitter at the people who have a St George's flag in their avatar and they are talking about bringing back the death penalty and they are talking about women getting back to the kitchen and they are talking about the environment climate change denial and they are talking about they're, they're talking about arguments that we buried years ago they're talking about black people being stupider than white people they're talking about it being right to incarcerate people until you've decided whether or not to let them out they're talking about windrush being a fair price to pay for less immigration they're talking about the most horrible views which you really thought that you'd won the argument on but the argument is never won the argument is merely a kind of I suppose what I'm interested in is if the argument is never on, never won, and if we are all biconceptual, and if we all can respond differently, why are those arguments winning now when they weren't previously? Well, I guess I, I don't think we're all biconceptual. I mean, I think there's a, a middle ground, but there are people who are more on one side or the other. So, I mean, the question, is it more important for a child to be well-mannered or considerate, tells you sort of four times as much about someone's Brexit or Trump vote than their income or class. So, even something as innocuous as that, yeah, I think is important. Now, why now? Well, I think, certainly if we look at Europe, there's no question that if you look at the migration, or in Britain as well, if you look at migration numbers, and people, what's, what happened is it wasn't that people who were pro-migration became anti-migration, it's people who were already anti-migration, which is a majority of the public, say 65, 70%, those people might have had immigration as the number five or six issue. And then as migration increased, that went from number six or seven up to number one or two. And the same things happen in Europe, and once that happens, the populist right numbers rise. It, it's a pretty strong relationship. So, so, you, so it is, the, is the contention then that anti-immigrant feeling is directly correlated with numbers of immigrants? Um, generally, I mean, in the recent period, absolutely. Although it's not, uh, uh, it's not a hard and fast iron rule. So it didn't quite happen that way in the United States, and we can get into why that is. So it's not everywhere. But in nine, say, in nine out of ten. West, the study was done recently, 9 out of 10 West European countries between 2007 and 2017, I think it was. Um, you see this relationship, rising numbers, rising salience, rising populist vote. 
So, so but if it's all numbers, right? If it's all, you know, a lot of people start moving about and then people don't like it and then they tap into their kind of conservative sides um, and it, it generates a lot of anti-immigrant feeling. How do you account then? Because that's quite a practical explanation, right? That's like too many people coming, stop the people. How do you then account for the fact that it comes accompanied by a whole slew of other ideas which are nothing to do with immigration? Which ones do you have in mind? Well, you know, the, the, most of the tenor of the Brexit argument is very authoritarian. It's very kind of, to, to sod them, we'll go our own way, the empire was great, you know, it was, it was brilliant when we just did our own thing. It's kind of isolationist, it's completely rewriting history, but let's part that. Um, it's, it's, it's very dominating, it's very kind of masculinist often, it's very kind of we won, end of. You know, you're seeing a whole slew of arguments which don't really relate to immigration, but they do relate to a very authoritarian way of thinking. And I, I suppose the question is, if immigration, if kind of anti-immigrant feeling is simply too many immigrants, how do the rest of these views just kind of parasite onto that? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, that you're going to be more likely to be anti-immigration if you hold those views. So that's one correlation. But the other part of this, which is interesting, is I think that the actual, the parties, you know, say the, the Brexit campaign, I mean, they were very reluctant to admit that immigration was what was driving that vote. And it was, and we know it was by far the most important thing. Um, they would, you know, it's more respectable, or seen as more respectable to talk about sovereignty or to talk about, you know, wanting to trade globally than to talk about immigration and especially sort of cultural drivers, uh, which is absolutely central. So it was much less respectable. So that's why I think you got this rhetoric around sovereignty and, and around some of these other things, which are important. Don't get me wrong, they are important for the Brexit elite, but I don't think in terms well, of drivers. They, no, I suppose, that, I, I suppose that that doesn't really get that. The, the, the sovereignty question, for instance, is a really good thing to raise because many people now cite it as the reason for voting Brexit who have never used the word sovereignty in their lives before 2016. I mean, people you've known for 40 years who you've never heard say sovereignty. So I don't take that that seriously. I do take seriously the slogan, the take back control, being a, a kind of huge and credible, actually, a huge and credible political change you could make for yourself without apparently costing yourself anything, obviously, because nothing was on the table, nobody would know what it, nobody knew what it would cost. But I still don't think, I think we do have to acknowledge that there is a, there is a kind of lot of toxicity. The reason they won't, they won't credit the immigration rhetoric as their kind of the main driver of their votes is because there's a lot of toxicity in it. There's a lot of racism in it. There's a lot of just kind of plain nastiness in it. There's a lot of kind of stupidity in it. Um, and if we're going to buy this line that, you know, that just the sheer, num sheer weight of numbers turned everybody into kind of less generous people, <coughs> I think we do have to account for the change that wrought in the rest of their characters. It was less generous because they voted to leave the European Union. Well, just le less generous in the sense that, you know, there was a huge, until the kind of reason, until probably the 2017 election, the Conservatives could get away with saying basically anything, kind of unrelenting nastiness about, about immigrants, about um, <coughs> basically anybody economically inactive was kind of fair game. And it was quite, it, it, it was a new era between 2016 and 2017. I think it's changed a bit now. But it was very, there was very much a kind of open season for the, the, worst, the worst iteration of your political views. You were suddenly allowed to say it. On both sides or just on the Tory side? Um, I mean, I because suppose there was, was a bit more... Out and the Lib Dems got there was a bit more... Everyone well, sort of came home politically that, for a short period. That was a, progressive, that was a progressive alliance in action. Good. Nobody <laughs> believes me when I say that, but it's true. <laughs> Uh, questions. We'll jump in and get some comments and questions. We started the discussion about kind of good nationalism and bad nationalism. I have a question about that. If we were in the business of trying to construct good nationalism, would we have any clues somewhere about how we might do that? Gail, I mean, there's this uh, author called Benedict Anderson who says that it's all about an, an imagined community. So if the community is too large for you to know everybody personally, then you could have a nation. So Singapore could be a nation. Um, but yeah, in terms of good nations, um, well, one thing I, I mean, one of the things that I try and get across is that this idea that you'll have a single 
concept of the nation that will be drilled into the population through the school system and the military. And, uh, I just think that's an old-fashioned model that doesn't really work. So I think you have to allow for different conceptions of the nation depending on if you're in Scotland or in England or ethnicity or class. I mean, that's going to change your view of the nation in terms of what's in your head. So there are many competing conceptions of nationhood that can exist at the same time, and I think that's actually a productive one. I can't remember who said it, but there's sort of one version of good nationalism is the nationalism of the small country that's been bashed up by its big neighbor, and then the version of bad nationalism is the, 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 the nationalism of the big country that bashes up its small neighbors. <laughs> but they actually, in terms of their content, are very similar. But I think, I think this notion that there are, you know, there was once thought that there were civic nations like France and ethnic nations like Germany, and, and you know, really that's not the way it works. You've got both an ethnic and a civic mm. conception in both. And they're negotiating their different ways of seeing things. Do we need a larger concept here than the ones you've enunciated to make sense out of this totally confusing and totally disturbing world that we find ourselves in? Well, I mean, <laughs> look, everybody, that this, this actually plays quite well into my argument. At some point, you have to dignify your compatriots with looking at a granular level at the problems they're saying. So it might well, they might well have some similarities with the Five Star Movement in Italy, and actually there are, there are kind of, there are kind of similarities in the kind of left, in the kind of far left elements of it, and it might well have some similarities with the National Front in France. But I don't think if you, I don't think to extrapolate to kind of wind back out to the to the principles which could explain them all would be particularly useful in dealing with the ones that explain these. Because it's a kind of act of disrespect really to say this these problems aren't important enough until they're either more dramatic or they have more in common. You know, you have to say we don't, you know, we don't have a huge racist violence problem as yet. We, do, we have the government is much more racist than the citizens so far. Um, <laughs> the, the, you know, we we don't. It's not very interesting on a world stage, and it's and it is quite small. But I still think it's it, it's Sorry, it's only right. Is the so, government racist at the moment? Well, I mean, I do think the Windrush decisions are racist. I think the decision to deport 7,000 students on the basis that their college had lied about their English test, but their English was fine. I think that's racist. I think. R race, racist in terms yeah, of yeah. asserting that one race is in what sense? In racist? terms of thinking that you can apply different standards of statecraft to one race, racial group. <laughs> yes, yeah. which you wouldn't do to a person in Hampshire. Did you see that Daily Mash piece where it said Theresa May intends to deport all of us <laughs> because none of us can find four documents from every year that we've lived here? Now we're into the question of race. Why don't you add and break, uh, Eric, the, um, what the subtitle of your forthcoming book in October? Yes, well, Populism, Me. Immigration, and the Future of White Majority. So yes. that's the other thing we haven't brought up, which is connected to nationalism, but the, there's an, another layer, which is the ethnicity layer, right? So in Western countries, well, in many European countries, and in Western countries, you have ethnic majorities. And so it might be the white British here, the US would be white American, or, and, and, this is actually the key actor, I think, in the current populism wave. Because the, the challenge, in a way, is not really to the nation state, which can adapt to pretty much any ethnic religious configuration. It's not really a threat to the nation state. But it's much more that level down below, the sort of ethnic majority layer, which is where we're seeing a lot of the angst. So what does it mean? Not so much, the question isn't what so much, you know, what does it mean to be Swedish? in an age of large-scale migration is what does it mean to be white Swedish or white British? You know, that question. And it is an important question, and I think we do have to open up a conversation about it. Clearly, immigration is not going to come from white countries, for at least in North America, less so here. So that, that I think, is a very important conversation. <coughs> and I think we make a mistake if we just demonize these groups. Yeah, I'm, I'm only laughing because no. white Swedish does sound inherently funny in a way that white British somehow doesn't, right, right. but that's a familiarization. So can you, can you crystallize the questions that we need to think about then? 
Well, I mean, I think a lot of this is about, again, ethnocultural change is being experienced by these ethnic majorities. And, and one of, you know, in the book, I don't want to give away too much because it's not published. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> you can but say anyway, whatever. You're among friends. Well, yeah, it's I don't care or not. You are already. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. It's been published by Penguin <laughs> October. Very interesting. Unless there's something incredibly controversial in there, yeah. which is going to be the Sunday Times first. Okay. Well, no, but anyway, there has to be. right. You're fine. You're yeah. So, again, these, this, no pressure. this chunk of the population that is more conservative, that is more into stability and security and is attached to these ethnic myths and symbols uh, over generations. So they need to have some vision of where they're going. Right now the message is you're just shrinking, you're just declining. And as long as that, and if there's been study after study has been done on this, this was a big driver of the Trump vote, for example. Um, people are kind of, you know, they know that at one level we should be good civic nationalists, that's just the American creed, but of course, at the other level, there's contestation at the neighborhood level. And so, part, I mean, I, I'm kind of trying to argue, I'm giving too much away, that there needs to be... Give it away, <laughs> man. Give it away. That there needs to be some positive vision, and, and I think it does involve uh, sort of seeing positivity and voluntary assimilation. So I think there, there has to be some kind of way in which this, this group can see kind of future for itself. And I think it's true. Assimilation and inter intermarriage. So sorry. So the, 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 the yeah, I agree with that. I agree with the, yeah. I agree with the intermarriage thing. So, so your 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 contention is that this this group, which is a, a which ethnic majority, an ethnic majority, it's a very large number of people. The, yeah. A substantial number of them are pessimistic about their future and the and the the, the things that give their lives <coughs> meaning, and the future of those things. And that that is meeting, and that that's finding its political expression in how that is that is the law. I mean, a significant chunk of the support base for these movements is that not in Eastern Europe. I think there's something different, and I'm happy to talk about that. But I think in West Western, the main immigrant receiving Western countries, that's the dynamic. And so, so basically, so you're yeah. saying what white people feel that they're in decline? Is that really what you're yes, saying? Yes, and they are in decline. Of course, they are in decline. So there has to be a way of thinking about that that isn't just you're in decline and you're going to the wall. So there has to be some other way of... Because they're still doing pretty well in most places, white people. Yeah, it's not that they're not doing well. It's, that's what I'm saying. I don't think this yeah. is... And I don't think it's also about losing power. I don't think they're, they're scared that somehow someone's going to come after them. I mean, some, of course, some people have those fears, but I think in many cases it's just a cultural demographic. The white elites are doing fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I don't, think, fine. I don't think white people generally are doing fine. No, no. I mean... I, do, I mean, you, you're very resistant to any kind of economic um, <laughs> it, it kind of context, but the truth of it is there, there has been wage stagnation in all these countries for a very long time. So, if it did, you know, in America since the 70s, there's been really, really problematic wage, wage stagnation, and life is different for people who would once have considered themselves lower middle class. And it, and the I, I think the idea that you could give you could flog them a positive story about their ethnicity and that would make that would put them in a better mood and then they start to be more accepting is missing the bigger picture, which is that their lives are getting worse. Is, is your to follow up Zoe's point? Is your contention, Eric, that um, even if the economy was booming, these demographic these deep structural demographic forces would still be playing themselves out in the worst, yeah. kind of the way they are now. Absolutely, and I think we, we do see that because with the economic crisis there was no uptick in populist right vote or But this is the uptick! No, but at the time of the 2007-8 crisis there was nothing. Whereas I know, once the I know, but, 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 but the migration crisis changed it. It took, it's, it's it took 10 years for us to realise. When your wages stagnate, you don't notice in six months. You notice in five years when you can't afford your dental work. Or you notice in six years when your sister can no longer put you up when you can't afford your rent because she can't afford her rent either. These things have an incredibly long tail. No, but they've been going on for decades and decades, so why now? Well, Doesn't because really the financial crash happened in 2008, and it's now 2018. Okay, uh, I tend to, to rather see sort of closer correlations than, than those kinds of very broad strokes. I mean, which is fine. I mean, there's, there's room. I'm not saying the economics doesn't matter at all. It matters a bit for Brexit, for sure. Uh, there's no question poorer people were more likely to, to vote leave. It doesn't, I haven't been able to find anything in the Trump voting. Um, even within white Americans, poor rich didn't really... Yeah, but it's not about comparing 
hit the Clinton voters with Trump voters. It's about looking at everybody's lives and saying, are they materially worse than they were before the financial crash? And that is true of everybody, apart from the top 5%. It's, it's true, but I think you can see that with the left-wing populism, sort of Sanders and, and, and Podemos and those sorts of phenomena are tied to what you're talking about, but not the right-wing populism. Just because you've decided? No, because I've looked at the large-scale data, which I think, which I trust much more than individual instincts. I mean, I just... I, I, I want just think we have to try and just crystallize the differences. Mm -hmm. so, so you're saying that there, you're saying that there isn't a, an economic component at all to this stuff? Not well. There, I didn't say at all. I, mean, no, I think in the Brexit okay. vote there is. It's a, It's it's maybe what. It's about a fifth as important as the cultural stuff. So in the in the Trump's voting, I haven't been able to find. It's almost nothing. So it's very limited in the Trump vote. Yeah. But the you know the issue here is so for example education is much more important than income or class as a discriminant on the populist voting because education is a window into worldview and into these deep values in a way that economic position and income is just not. I'm saying if you can't see any correlation between the fact that there's a global financial crash and then everybody in the OECD has a far right option, which a huge number of them are voting for. Now the fact that, you know, they, you, of course you can say there, are, there, there have been elements of this in France and there were elements of this in France in 2000. And of course you can find kind of individual countries who have had these spurts of feeling periodically, but you've never had it in this kind of coordinated way before. Well, I think that if you look, if you just look at what's happened in Europe on migration since 2012, I mean, it's, you know, it's all coming out of Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, but if you look at the numbers, those correlate extremely well with what's gone on with the salience of immigration, and that's what drives populist right support. I mean, it's just a very tight you know, it's a very good relation. It's not the only thing. I mean, it's not. My, I'm not trying to pretend it's the only thing. Economics does matter, but for populist right support, I think it's a relatively small influence, and it's been overplayed. Yeah, I just, you know, I, it just does not come out in the data. We would have expected the populist. You know, we would expect the economic crisis to have dramatically, or to have had some impact on overall populist right voting. Do you think the Progressive Alliance, so he has, yes. some, has had enough to say about? Patriotism. Well, no, because we're still locked in this battle about whether we care about the door doing or Darlington. Well, I want to go back I mean, to that. Yeah. You know, well, how are we going to get out of that? Well, how are we going to get out of that? <laughs> well, I think well, you have to acknowledge that there's kind of beauty and ugliness in 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 solidarity. I think solidarity does have it is the engine of most things of value, but it also has some kind of protectionist. Um, characteristics and you know if Trump is a really good your point about Trump is a really good example that um, you know they're kind of these, li these liberal spurts of upsetness about him a lot of what he was saying about trade you could have read in a lefties manifesto at any point between 1965 and 1989 um, and I mean that's kind of sorry that was a, a slightly tangential example but the, the, the fact of it is there is there, there are these arguments which the left finds it impossible to have with it with itself and because it's so long since we've been in power it's been not that important to resolve because you know <laughs> well, you, the, the, the impetus isn't there but there was something happened in the 90s I, I, well, it seems to me that something might have happened in the 90s which is to say there was a, a bunch of social democrats like Blair uh, well, there's a bunch of social democrats who said if you if you weaken the nation state, you'll weaken nationalism itself. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there was yeah. another bunch of people who said if you weaken the nation state, you'll free up global trade. Mm -hmm. And Blair and Schroeder and Clinton were all advocates for both. And Blair yeah, was like the yeah. high priest of both of these views, yeah. and rode both horses at the same time. For like on the one hand, weaken the nation state to weaken uh, to embed us in larger structures, and so you'll weaken nationalism. And yeah. You might also uh, ch ch change the rules on immigration at the same time. And they equally. Um, uh, you free up global trade by weakening the nation states. Well, but I was, the public never consented to release either of those. There was this horrible, and the, and the thing which I remember about the about the kind of, which I think really characteristic of that period of government, which it, you know did a, did a lot of things that I really applaud, but he did do this. He did have this line that his definition of a successful country was one that lots of people wanted to move to, and it was quite glib, <coughs> and he used it to legitimise it an influx of European migration which he could have delayed or staggered in a different way and when it became plain that people minded 
he kind of channeled all their rage onto asylum seekers, refugees, but he recast them as asylum seekers. And that and it was his idea to stop asylum seekers working, which made them, which looked like it was kind of punitive and a deterrent, but, but also made them incredibly needy of the state. So he created complete impecuniousness and destitution, just, to, just as a kind of sop to the people who objected to his EU strategy, which was a completely different idea. And it was really fundamental bad faith, I think, and, funda and a fundamental playing to... But even if we'd had a transitional period, um, and they hadn't yeah. gone for whatever it was, first mover advantage on the labour market benefits of massive European migration. Yeah, I mean, that is ridiculous, isn't it? Like, you need first mover advantage um, but over bloody Germany. Lots of things that effectively have, had, have contained constitutional change have been brought in by treaty in forms of treaty with the European Union. Yeah. Whenever those treaties have been put to popular vote, every, anywhere in Europe, including Ireland, Everybody France, always. Everyone always, without them, fail, yeah. says no. <laughs> and that, and that whatever one thinks about the benefits which have been considerable and some of the changes in the labour market to uh, very substantial sociologically transformative levels of migration since 97, it was never in any party's manifesto, there was no popular consent for it. No, 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 and, you any know, and this was always, manifesto would have been annihilated. And this was always the left wing, the, the left wing um, critique, which is why it's so surprising to hear Jacob Rees-Mogg using it, <laughs> which is that, you know, in Maastricht there was this massive lacuna, once you've got once all these nation states have given up the, the, the rights that they had, who has them? Who has those yes. rights? And there was this chasm in the explanation of what, of what that would mean. And instead of ever filling it with anything on paper or written down, we just kind of muddled through. It but it turns nice. out, it, it does turn out that muddling through, like the Good Friday Agreement, yeah. is better than not muddling through. And it can't be, it can't be kind of capsized without some, yes. some d difficulty. Because for all these shared arrangements, you know, we continue to follow American politics in granular detail. We know. know nothing about what's happening <coughs> in Spain or France or Portugal. Well, we know a bit, don't we? Know. I mean, we know, we, know when, we know when Spain is about to get somebody for treason. <laughs> we know when. Italy is ruled by five different parties, and they all That's want true. to get rid of immigrants. But you will accept. It. Um, <laughs> What, it, well, I mean, I think, I, think, I think that's quite straightforward, right? There's a, you know, that I, I, we follow American politics because it's a lot livelier and we understand the language. But so um, do other Europeans follow American yeah, politics. Yeah, because it, we, all understand, we all understand the language, right? So, you, so that, I think, is completely straightforward. But I think we do see, see ourselves as more European than American. 